Hey guys, this is MJ, the student actuary, and we're going to be looking at the relationship between returns on asset classes, and this is chapter 22 of subject CA1. And I'm going to show you the next slide, um, which is probably one of the most important slides in the entire course, as this slide over here is something that, I mean, my lecturer focused a lot of time on and a lot of his practice exam questions which he gave to us were based around this formula um, and just you know, the whole relationship between required return and expected return so what we're going to do is we're going to look at each one and see how that actually compares to the actual return so required return I'm an investor and I want to invest my money. How much do I require, um, you know, how much money do I, oh sorry, let's start that again. I'm an investor, I'm investing my money, what return do I require? And it's gonna be determined by three things, okay? Um, the risk-free real yield, the expected inflation, and the risk premium. The risk-free real yield is the amount of money that I can get by putting uh, my cash in the bank and this is considered um, there's absolutely no chance that I'll lose it. However, as we've seen in Greece, this has not been the case. People who have put their money in the bank have seen it lost or have seen parts of it lost. So this whole idea of risk-free, I mean, you can get into a whole philosophical uh, discussion that it doesn't actually exist but let's just assume that if I put my money in the bank there's a risk-free rate that I can get and let's say that is five percent then when I'm going to go and invest um, my money in the bond market or the stock market or the property market I'm going to expect to get five percent plus two other things Okay, the next thing is inflation. If I expect inflation to increase at say 2%, then what I want to do is my required return will be 5 plus 2, which is 7, at plus this risk premium. So the higher inflation is, the higher um, my required return. And then we get to this final thing here called the risk premium. Okay, and what exactly is the risk premium? And this is where it gets difficult. The risk-free yield, I can get straight by going to the bank and seeing what they'll give me. Expected inflation, I can kind of work out by looking at the bond curve, uh, bond yield curve and what uh, economists are forecasting. But this risk premium is something that's hard to quantify. It's hard to say exactly what it is. We kind of have a hunch for it. So we know that the equity market will have a, a higher risk premium than the bond market because there's a higher chance that my money uh, will disappear on the stock market than in the bond market. But exactly by how much, that's where, that's where this becomes difficult. It's not a hard science anymore. It becomes what's your opinion, what's your hunch, what's your risk appetite, what, um, you know, what else is there to, to look at. So risk premium is something where you want to focus a lot of your attention on when answering these questions, but don't forget you can get easy mask by mentioning the risk real real the risk free real yield and expected inflation. Uh, but when you look at required returns, you also want to compare this to expected returns. Okay? And expected returns are built from two things. It's how much money or how much of the returns are going to come in the form of income and how much is going to come in the forms of growth. So let's say I buy a share at 10, 10 Rand or $10 today. Uh, it's going to give me $1 dividend and it's going to, I'm going to be able to sell it for $12 next month. Then I've seen uh, $2 in capital growth and $1 in initial income yield. So that's how my expected return comes from. Uh, income yield and expected capital growth and each of these you can calculate separately um, 
and determine what they are using probability and statistics and mathematics and all those wonderful things you learned doing the core technical subjects. Um, so yeah, an investment will have its expected return and an investor will have his required return. If the expected return is greater than the required return, then the investor will invest in that asset. However, randomness and uncertainty and all these things influence the investment. And this is just an expected return. It's, a, it's not guaranteed. And, it could, and therefore, we get this other thing here called the actual return which could be higher than expected return, and if invest invested in that, he's going to be very happy. But if the actual return is lower than the expected return, um, then the investor, he will be, he'll still be happy if the actual return is higher than required return. Um, but normally, I mean, the required return and expected return are so close together that if the actual return is lower than expected return, it's very likely to be lower than the required return, and the investor will be upset. And yeah, so the, these are the three things you need to know. This is the investor, uh, this is from the investment, and this is what actually happens. And yeah, so like I said, if the required return is equal to the expected return, then we consider it to be fairly priced and it's of good value. And then just some other things that you want to, or some statements um, that you want to get from this chapter is that dividend growth should be around about what the GDP growth is. Uh, fixed interest stocks have no income growth, they just have the gross redemption yield. And index linked bonds returns a real rate, which we can therefore use as the benchmark. Cash exceeds inflation, except during inflation spikes, and wages and salaries grow in line with GDP. So these were just five other statements that are pulled out of the chapter. But like I said, the main thing to focus on from this chapter is this whole required return and expected return. And yeah, um, each, like I said, each asset class will have a different expected return and an investor will also have a different required return for each asset class as each asset class would have a different risk premium. So this is why it becomes a very difficult decision for an investor to make his choice because he needs to compare required return to expected return to see if it's fairly priced for every single asset. And that's why they normally do it, you know, just as an asset class. And then if it meets that, then they'll go look at an industry. If it meets the industry, then they'll go look at a specific as, um, stock or company. So yeah, investing, you can see it's not just, oh, I feel that this share is going to go up today and I buy it. No, there is quite a lot of thought that goes behind it. But yeah, thanks for watching this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Cheers.